you. And thank you for inviting me in. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, uh, a little bit about myself, not a lot, just a little bit about myself. I'm, um, I'm an Ilaketmak woman from uh, South Central British Columbia. I come from a, a community called Lower Nicola, outside of the community of Merritt. And uh, I was born in that community. I, I live and work about a mile and a half from the spot I was born. I was born at home, as were my um, parents, my grandparents, and as far back as we know. And my children and my grandchildren. I'm, I'm the mother of eight. Three are biological, and I'm the grandmother of ten. Uh, and I've, I've worked really hard throughout my life to, um, I don't know, address things that just don't seem right. Uh, it, our um, elder who gave the prayer talked about the treatment of his daughter. I can remember walking down the street of my community with my grandmother. My grandmother, a wonderful woman, uh, um, tiny woman. I, I look at Viola and think that that's about the size of my grandmother. Just a, a little woman in, uh, with a great big package of things to do. <laughs> and, uh, but we walked down and she dressed in her traditional way, you know. Uh, those of you who have grandmothers or older women who wear about three layers of clothes. You know, and uh, have their underwear, and then there's their slips, and then there's three skirts, and then their blouses, and their stuff. Well, that was my grandmother. Uh, and we walked down the street in the, in the community, and she, she and us, being tiny, you know, we're small, four, five, six, seven, and eight, you know, at the time, being treated with incredible disrespect. You know, we'd walk down the street, and, and you'd have these men in their three-piece suits doing exactly what they did to her exactly what they did to your daughter, spitting at her and calling her a squaw and telling her to get out of the way, and, and by extension, us as well. And so I'm telling you here today that I, I was a young squaw watching this and feeling the rejection and feeling the, the anger and whatever it is they were projecting. And today, I'm really proud to say I'm an old squaw. I, if I didn't acknowledge my, my history and the fact that I am a squaw, I would be disrespecting my grandmother. Because she was a squaw that walked and held her head up, even though they were treating her so badly. Because she wouldn't acknowledge, she wouldn't acknowledge them. They would be uh, spitting at her and talking to her, and she'd walk as if they didn't exist. Which is, is um, something that I think many of us have to do given the relationship we have with Canada, with the non-Aboriginal members of our community and the state. And I guess what that taught me was that things just aren't right in our world. They're just not right. There's no way that any of us should have to put up with that kind of stuff. And uh, they expected it. They expected my grandmother to cower and and, and duck away from them, and they expected us to get the message that you know we were we weren't uh, full citizens, we weren't uh, members of the society, full members of the society. We were members that didn't deserve any kind of acknowledgement. A powerful message to little girls. Powerful message to to Aboriginal members of the community. And what it did for me was to think that. Well, this isn't right, and I'm not going to put up with it. And so I've spent my entire life fighting it in a whole lot of different ways. But um, for our communities, we have, we have a huge history of, of this kind of treatment. Uh, I can recall growing up again of, of um, going to the movies in the community. We had a theater in our community. It was a small community. So when the movie got out at 9 o'clock and it was dark and I would be walking home, and if you saw a headlight anywhere, you jumped into the bushes. Because we were free game. You know, as Indian women, as indigenous women, as squads, we were free game. And if somebody decided to pick us up off, pick us up off the street and do what they wanted with us, nobody would even care. You know, you could report it, and nobody would care. Now let's. Now we're talking early 50s. Let's fast forward to 2010. How much of that has changed? How many of us walking down the street today are still subjected to that kind of treatment? Um, 
a lot of it has gone underground. You know, it's not quite as blatant, but it's still there. And we've been relegated to a place in society that people don't think they need to acknowledge us or respect us or they can treat us with disrespect and get away with it. And so much to the, to the fact that they can look at these women, um, like these young women that we just heard about, you know, full members of the community, not uh, being, uh, I guess, labeled as deviant or drug addicts or whatever, and look at them and see them and think, I can take this woman and I can do what I want with her and nobody will care. They're free game. You know, and we're talking 50, 60 years later, they're still free game. And will, uh, will I have to pay for it? Absolutely not. And so if you're looking at the 600 plus Aboriginal women across the country that have um, uh, been subjected to the treatment, those men, and I can tell you almost 100% of them are men, will look at these women, these young women, and in the history that they, they've been taught, many of them have been taught that, that history, that somehow because we're, we're Aboriginal and we're women, we have a lesser place in society and they can, uh, can do what they want, they can abuse, and the state won't respond. Uh, part of my uh, work has been addressing this situation in, in various forms. And I, I've been an activist for as long as I remember. I, I asked my aunt, my aunt is 89 now, and she was actually with my mom the night that I was born. My mom was giving birth and she was there with my mom. And so she act, act, saw me being born and I, I said, you know, a lot of people don't like me, you know. And they don't like me because when somebody does something wrong, I say, that's wrong. And you shouldn't do it. And uh, you know why do you why are you doing this? And so they don't like me because I, I can't tell it like it is. And she said, "Well, you were born kind of like that. <laughs> I was there when you were born, and you were so hard to manage because you would always say, well, why or why not? And if we didn't give you the right answer, you would argue with us, <laughs> and we could never convince you. You would never be convinced." because you have your own way of looking at it. So uh, she convinced me that I was born to the, do the kind of work that I did, do, because they couldn't manage me. My mom was totally frustrated because I, I would never um, listen to what she had to say. I would never do what she told me to do. And if she told me to do something, I'd likely do the opposite. <laughs> and so, and I guess part of it was training for the kinds of things that we run into today kinds of things that I've run into and probably many of you run in, have run into being um, women and minorities and, uh, your entire life. And some of us put up with it um, and some of us don't. And what, ki what kind of difference can you make? Well, I think we probably can make a lot of difference, but I, the most important thing is not to give up on it. I know that um, Earlier on, I, I, when I started speaking out nationally about the, the things that happen to women, and in particular Aboriginal women, I would get calls from Aboriginal women across the country. And they say, well, I need to talk to you. This is happening to me, or this, that's happening to me. And I can remember going into a community on southern Vancouver Island, and there was a little group of women, and they said, we're having a really hard time in our community. And the men are being brutes. <laughs> You know, they're, they're beating us and they're raping us. And when we called the police, the police, one woman in particular said that um, a man came in and he raped me in my home. So I called the police, I called the RCMP, and the RCMP told me that I can't come on your reserve without your chief and council's permission. So the next night, the man who raped me, who is the brother of a council member, came back and raped me again. And he cut me on my abdomen, not, not badly, but cut me on my abdomen and said, if you report it again, it's going to be worse. And um, these are members of our own community. This is not interacting with the, um, uh, with the Canadian state in any regard. But the other thing that he told her 
when she complained, she, she phoned in the complaint and asked to have the complaint registered. Well, you wanted self-government, you've got it. That's what he told her. And what I see and, and what I've experienced throughout uh, the time I've been doing the advocacy is that kind of, of attitude from the state. You know, they, uh, I've, I've had a major hand in shutting down several alternative justice initiatives across the country because they abuse the women. You know, you've got rampant uh, uh, sex abuse and raping going on, and they're diverted to an elders council who, like, there's a good likelihood that some of the elders are relatives of those men who are raping. Uh, there, there was a, a situation again on southern Vancouver, and I don't know what's going on there, but um, a, a young man, not, a, not, not very old, he's in his mid-twenties, he, he raped up a woman in the community. She made a complaint. He raped her again about a week later on the hood of his car in the middle of the community, in full view of everybody. Nothing was done. His aunt, his ten-year-old uh, niece, or his aunt, his ten-year-old female cousin, his eight-year-old male cousin were out gathering berries, and he ran across them. He raped his aunt and his ten-year-old um, cousin, and he sodomized his eight-year-old cousin. And uh, the community chose not to do anything about it. The um, uh, woman that was raped twice did, was successful in bringing a charge, but she was so brutalized in the community by other community members, including his family, that she chose to leave the community. She left her daughter there with her mom because her daughter was going to school, and she moved to the uh, city of Victoria because she, you know, she was threatened. Walking her daughter to school, the car came right at them. They had to jump into the ditch. Um, somebody climbed up the trellis on the outside of her house and broke into the, broke the window and got in. It was her daughter's bedroom. And so she knew that she was being persecuted. And so she moved to the community to continue the charge against this man. She ended up being murdered in her apartment and that has never been solved. So um, it's not a friendly place out there for Aboriginal women. Aboriginal women that uh, are members of society and functioning members of society. <clears throat> if you look at the Aboriginal women who are not fully functioning members of society, things are even worse for them. You know, you've got the 500 plus, 600 plus missing and murdered Aboriginal women across the country. Well, uh, a good portion of them are are women who've had a real, had really struggled. And some of them have turned to the sex trade to support them, support themselves, support their, their drug habits or whatever. They're free game. You know, they have absolutely no protection whatsoever. Uh, nothing has changed. So what do we do? We do this kind of thing. Uh, uh, one of the things that I do is I, I do international work. So I go to the United Nations. And I, I've been to the United Nations uh, several times, mainly the CEDAW committee, the Committee for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And the Canada signed on to the committee, and, or the convention, and it says um, that they have to work on equality for women. So one of the many things that I've done at, at the um, CEDAW when I've gone there and talked to them is to tell them about the state's relationship with Indigenous women, Aboriginal women. And uh, I was last there in 2008, October 2008, and made a point of, uh, actually, I don't know if you know what the committee process is, but what happens at, a, at a, a, a committee on these conventions is that Canada has to report. They've signed on to the convention, and every so many years they've got to go in and report to the committee responsible for each convention about all the things they've done to comply with the convention. And so those of us who are non-government organizations will go and tell the committee what a horrible job Canada's doing in, in complying with the convention. And so I, I've been there a lot, and I, I always tell them how bad Canada's doing, especially in its relationship with that Indigenous or Aboriginal women. And when I was there in 2008, we, uh, we do several things uh, because as a non-government organization, we have 10 minutes. That's all we have 
to do a, a presentation to the committee. But we can uh, contact with the committee and lobby the committee outside of their committee time. And I was in, in New York in 2005 and, and listening intently and, there, and Canada was going to report and my, my particular interest is women, and in particular Aboriginal women. There was one woman on the committee that, that uh, when they were doing, they did Guatemala and they did Bolivia and one other country, but I could hear her asking questions about Indigenous women. Well, in, in your country, um, indigenous women, blah, 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 she'd ask questions and then they'd have to answer. You know, the committee members would have to answer. I said, I've got to talk to that woman because I've got things that I need her to ask Canada when Canada's examined. So I saw her get up and go up. It's in the, mini of the, in the middle of the committee hearing and out the door she went. So I followed her and she's going to the bathroom. So I followed her over mm -hmm. down the bathroom and sitting there tapping my toe waiting for her to come up. So from the bathroom door all the way back to the committee room, I motor mouthed. And I'm, saying, and I'm saying, you know, I'm sharing my car, blah, 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 all the way back. Get to the committee door and she looks at me. She doesn't speak English. <laughs> what I've been listening to was the interpreter. And, but anyway, we did resolve it and we did get together with an interpreter so we can talk to each other. So, you know, we do, uh, and we call, uh, we have free lunches, and we invite the committee to the free lunches so that we can brief them on what we think they should be asking Canada. Because we know Canada's, we've seen Canada's report, we know Canada's not telling the truth, and uh, they're fudging a lot of the truth as well. So we know that, and what we want the committee to do is to ask Canada specific questions about specific issues and so when I was there in 2008 and we had our luncheon with them, I asked them specifically to ask Canada about that relationship with the state. Why is it that when uh, you get a report of a missing woman, you don't follow up on it? The state doesn't respond and we know they're murdered. Do you know how we, we know they're murdered? Because somebody walking their dog stumbles over a body somewhere. And when the body is identified, it's one of these women who has been identified as missing. Could be for weeks, could be for months, could be for years. But they've never followed up on it. So why is it that they don't think they're obliged to do that when it comes to Aboriginal or Indigenous women? And uh, the other thing that I asked the committee to do was to consider, because uh, Mexico has the same problem in uh, what the uh, Ciudad Juarez area. Uh, they have a lot of women that have gone missing and, and a lot of them have been found and ended up murdered. And the UN committee, the CEDAW committee, went in and did an investigation. Uh, they didn't ask the, the, uh, the state to do an investigation. They went in and did an investigation. And I, I asked uh, uh, the CEDAW committee, why don't you do that? Why don't you come into Canada and investigate Canada on their relationship with the missing and, well, the indigenous women that turned out to be missing and murdered and their response to it. And uh, they didn't quite go that far uh, when they made their, re when they, they investigate or they questioned Canada on this particular subject. There were a whole lot of other subjects that we, that we uh, addressed, but this particular subject, they didn't quite go that far, but they did threaten them. They said, what is stopping us from going in and investing into this? And that's what I'd ask them to do. And they did ask Canada to report back when they, they did the report in November 2008. They asked Canada to report back on, on the missing and murdered Aboriginal women and what was Canada doing about it. And Canada, of course, has done nothing. I mean, they made an announcement today that, that it's worth nothing. They said they're going to put $10 million in and they're going to do certain things. They're going to beef up the, the policing. Well, you can beef up the policing all you want, but if the police don't respond, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And if they have a mindset about, and, and it's, what it's about is, are you worthy, and I'm looking at you Aboriginal women here, are you worthy of protection, of state protection? And the answer is no, you're not. And so they don't have to do it, and when they don't do it, and it comes out in the media, it doesn't really matter, because the, the public, um, the public doesn't care, and as you will hear, the media doesn't do a very good job of of putting it out there. They say, okay, you've got a, a drug addicted sex trade worker from the downtown east side that's gone missing and eventually ends up murdered. Well, that's too bad for her. If she didn't live that lifestyle, she'd be fine, right? 
and so this, you know, it, it, it's her own fault. And I don't know what they're going to say if and when. I'm hoping that your uh, your relatives and, and your friend um, have been snatched by the um, uh, the people who take the young girls and put them out with prostitutes. Yeah. I'm hoping that that's what has happened. Not that I want them to be put out as prostitutes, but they're still alive. That, you know, that, that's the piece. Because that's the other piece that's going on in our communities. That you've got um, uh, men that go in, sometimes befriend some of the girls, and get them into the sex trade, and then, and then traffic them into the larger cities in the Canada and the United States. So they disappear. They've got no access uh, to family. And so they can't call their family. And they've never called their family, but they've been. Some of them have been found, and there's a certain uh, percentage of them that are in that, uh, and and being young girls. But uh, it's you know you never know. But but that, that maybe that's the lesser of the two evils in this situation. So anyway, um, I didn't want to go on and on. We're just we're, we've got one more speaker. So I guess what the message is is that. What we need and what I've asked for internationally and what I'm lobbying for nationally is a full public inquiry, a national public inquiry about this. Because we, we've been asking for one, but no one has ever followed up on it. And um, our government, because of, of, of what their priorities are and because of the relationship with the media, uh, that they're never called to account for any of this stuff. You know, we've got a little blurb, blurb about Ramsey. We know that it was well beyond the judge, you know, and what is the atmosphere where the police can go and pick them up and trade them off? And something that isn't public, and, and these guys never like me, for making, like me for making this public. Some of our Aboriginal leaders are involved as well. They, uh, they get plum appointments from the provincial government. We've got Aboriginal leaders that, you know, they're sitting in on boards that pay them $500 a day and whatnot. Many of them have been supplying our young Aboriginal girls to these uh, guys that make the appointments. And um, uh, it's all part and parcel of how the world works in, in you know, in the government trade-off and, and uh, uh, favors and all of that. And, and they're hard to pin down. Uh, we did have one in BC where uh, they had enough, they thought they had enough evidence and it was quickly quashed by the, an Aboriginal leader and a bunch of lawyers just going after them and they, we weren't able to make it, uh, get it to the, into the courtroom because he was, uh, he had a couple of really prime appointments from the government and there was, there was clear evidence from the, the young women about him actually supplying them to the government officials for sexual favors. And we weren't able to get it any further uh, because uh, of the threat. You know, and for the, the young women, it was um, shut up or die. And so you know, you can't ask somebody to step forward and you know, take that. So anyway, I'm gonna, I wish I could leave you a happy note. Because you know there are a lot of good things going out there, but on out there. But tonight we're talking about these women that have almost like they've disappeared from the face of the earth, most of them, and nobody cares. And um, and if we don't do this, if we don't talk about it, if we don't uh, let them know wherever they are that they are loved and they're cared for, and there's some of us that won't give up until the wrongs that have been done to them have been addressed, then. Um, I know for me, I, I wouldn't be doing my job. So thank you very much.